Hello, and welcome to another very special episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan, and I'm very happy to welcome you to part two of our continuing series on my stroke and stroke recovery. Now, at the end of part one, the stroke itself, my wife had discovered me on the floor of our bedroom and had called the paramedics. Here in part two, we're going to talk about the subsequent brain surgery and trip to the intensive care unit that resulted from that call. It's important to remember, however, that even though I've told you that I suffered a hemorrhagic brain bleed on the right side of my brain, we didn't know that at the time, and we wouldn't know that for some time thereafter. In addition, I think it's also important to note, as I mentioned in part one, that I have virtually no recollection of the time period between my stroke and until I fully wake up on about January 5th or 6th, a few days after my surgery. I do know, however, that the paramedics took me to a local hospital named Ascension Providence, and that at that hospital, they had a level two trauma center and a comprehensive stroke center, which was very much to my benefit. A comprehensive stroke center includes all the things that a primary stroke center does, as well as advanced imaging, personnel trained in strokes and stroke recovery, as well as neuroscience ICU facilities and capabilities. So again, it was very much to my benefit that I wound up at this particular hospital. And I highlight these in website form because I wanted to point out that we're having a fundraiser on May 6, 2023, that I would ask you to circle in your calendars for both this hospital and my inpatient rehab hospital that we will mention at the end of this video. I'm very thankful for everybody involved at both of these hospitals for helping save my life. And we'll talk more about the awesome people that worked at Ascension and at my inhab, inpatient rehab facility as we get through this series. I also have visual free notions of talking with folks during this time about what happened, answering awareness questions, what year is it, who's the president, where are you, and thinking that everyone was far too easily pleased with by giving them a thumbs up on request. I was reminded of football stars being carried off the field and giving a thumbs up to many, many cheers, but never made the connection to medical concerns with myself. I also remember for a brief moment in time during this period rousing with the feeling that I was on a desk or table with plastic in my mouth. It was not painful, but I felt as if there was nowhere for my tongue to go, and I remember that pretty vividly. All these memories, however, are like mere blips, like when you wake up at 3.30 in the morning and do something quickly before going back to sleep. In between these things, however, things really did get wild. As for some questions that were asked on this particular topic, I, I got one from the community that said, I'm strangely interested in whether there was a kind of period of disconnect or disorientation involved around the acute event and treatment, where what you thought or understood to be happening to you around you may not be, have matched up with what your family was observing from the bedside, or did everyone's recollection of those days all largely match up? Well, I'm glad you asked because things really did get wild. I'm not a big dreamer under ordinary circumstances. Here though, however, while under heavy anesthesia and what I would later learn was brain surgery, I was dreaming of large scale fantasy landscapes. I know that's very on brand for me, but it was. Ashy mountains with rivers of lava and columns of monstrous army, like something out of the Lord of the Rings that I was participating in. My brain had apparently taken in enough information from just the awareness questions to know that I was receiving medical care and rationalized my experience in these places as being due to the doctor loving 70s style tabletop role playing games. This was actually my thought that he loved role playing games and I was somehow completing a quest to get a reward like a brain surgery. Anesthesia is a real trip, man. And though I would not know it for a while, my dream state would actually continue into ICU care. Those of you in the community may remember a time around the event when my wife would not let me use my phone or send messages. Much of that was because my brain was organizing my thoughts in an unusual way, and she didn't know what I would say to everybody else. Isn't that right, honey? Hey there. Hey. So, uh, yeah, well, I so this is interesting to me because you and I actually had an entire conversation in the ER. You don't remember that at all? Apparently not. Sorry. Yeah, they... Um, they, our experiences were so vastly different, and that and that uh, was something that we talked about a lot, right at you know in the early days in January, because they let me see you in the ER, and I went back to talk to you, and you were apologizing. You were saying you were sorry that this happened. You were sorry that you wouldn't. We had been making plans to like take the kids out that day. You were sorry you wouldn't be able to go with us to go out shopping. And we had a whole conversation. We were joking around about how, you know, the next time you need a vacation, maybe we should just take one and not have a medical event. And so that's where it, my worst vacation ever mantra came in, right? Yeah. That was no, that was later. That was oh. later. So, so, but we had that whole conversation in the ER. And the other thing that was was happening then was that you we were talking, but you were falling asleep. 
in mid sentence because there was so much pressure in the brain. And the way it was explained to me was that the, the right lobe was pressing on that left lobe and calling and, and causing you to fall asleep. Um, this is before so my brain that, surgery that prior to brain surgery. Yeah. This was, this was maybe only a couple hours after you had been taken to the, to the ER and they, the, the ER doc came and told me he, the first thing he said was your husband is very sick. And they were going to try to get your blood pressure under control. And then he was going to call in the surgery team to see what they could do. And that phrase to me was really confusing because he said to see what they could do. Like if they, if they can't do something, what's going to happen to Rick Hogue? Like I, sure. that was confusing to me. Never at any point did I think you weren't going to make it though. That was never, and I'm glad I did not Google the likelihood of that happening either. Yeah, never my percentages point, weren't great. No, but never at any point did I think that was going to happen, partly because, and this doesn't happen with every stroke, right? Some people present with stroke symptoms and they're talking complete gibberish because the stroke is affecting their speech center. And so right. they're thinking they're speaking clearly, but the words that are coming out are not the right words at all. You and I had a complete conversation that made total sense at that time. Right. And then after the brain surgery, I wake up, but I'm still talking a little bit of nonsense, right? Post surgery, so, it was, no, it made, it, it made, the words made sense. Right. But the content was bizarre. Right. And that, and, that was a little scary to me because I didn't know what was medically, like you're coming off of this medication, you're in the ICU, you've just had surgery. And what is like a major cognitive issue that's going to be permanent? Right, because I just had a brain injury. Absolutely, right. I understand so that. I'm kind of like I'm not really sure what's what's happening here, but we're just we're just going to go with it. Right, and to give some context here to what we're talking about, I was convinced, as a for instance, that the night nurse was removing me from the hospital and escorting me to what I had called the ICU apartments every evening, where I would have my own interactions with both him and other people before relaying them to my bewildered wife and family the next day. Right. So this is the kind of thing I was dealing with. I thought for a short period of time that the hospital had been moved to the Hudson Bay in New York in order to get some specialist treatment done. And I don't know why this was happening. I liken it to essentially when you wake up or when you when you're dreaming that you've woken up and that you go through your day a little bit and you go through your work and then you wake up again because that was actually all just a dream, except that my experience was so alien. I wasn't used to being in this hospital. I wasn't used to dealing with all this stuff. I was under heavy anesthesia and I was recovering that I really was not making a distinction between my dream state and my waking state. And so I was relaying memories that I had of real experiences that I had as a dreamer as if they had happened. And then my wife, my mom, my family would all look at me like I was frankly, crazy and justifiably so, but it takes a little bit of getting used to when that happens. It took a family friend who was also a neuro nurse to convince me of any of this, that any of this was happening. And as I was very used to trusting my brain, she did so not by arguing with me, but by simply asking questions. No one will let you out of your bed right now. Do you really think you traveled the neighborhood last night? Does that make sense? It's hard to admit even internally to something like that at the time, but she was a godsend right then and was always very careful to say that she did not dispute that I believed that these experiences had happened she was not calling me a liar, just trying to point out that they didn't make any sense in the reality that we were living in. But that was my subjective experience. What was really happening during all this time, Mrs. Hogue? So, uh, God bless our friend. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, first of all, because she was she was helpful to me too in explaining like, oh yeah, there's this ICU delirium. And quite frankly, living in Michigan didn't help because the view out the window was gray skies every gray day. Gray on gray. And there was nothing different. And it's not like the sun came up and you knew which what was day and what was night either. Come visit everybody. It's gray on gray and you can't tell what you're looking at. Yeah, it, it was a, it was a mess. I mean, the most exciting thing was not exciting for the person in the helicopter was we watched the we watched the U of M, uh, you know, life flight helicopter land one day. That was the only thing you saw out the window. To be clear, you watched that. I, I did not get an angle of that from the hospital bed. Right. So, I mean, it, there was no, there was no way for you to kind of distinguish a day from night and what was happening anyway. I mean, there, so you spent several days on a, on a ventilator and uh, we were with you. There was someone with you most of the time. And uh, there was a point where I looked at the nurse the first day you were, you were, it was, it was, uh, it must have been post surgery. We were in the in the room actually the second day, and I looked at the nurse and I said, um, 
I don't want you to think I'm stupid, but I can't do anything here. <laughs> I would like to go home and hug my kids and eat something and try to sleep. And she was like, no, you should go get some rest and take care of yourself. Absolutely. And, and I'm so, I'm so glad that like someone else validated that was the right choice to make in that moment uh, because I did come home and enjoy the kids and kind of like re refill my cup so that I could go back and be with you the next day. And, and that was, that was a, a hard choice to make, but like there really wasn't, I couldn't do anything more for you in that moment. They were taking very, very good care of you. you um, back to deal with your husband telling you about the trip he took to New York state. Oh, oh my yes. gosh. Yeah. And, and it took us a couple days to get you to a place where you were breathing strongly enough to take you off that ventilator and they, they would periodically like wean you off the meds just a little bit. And then they would get real close and yell at you, Rick, show us what you can do. Because they were checking to see, can you thumbs up on that left side? Can you move your foot or your leg? What is going on with your body in that moment? And so that was like every couple hours, they would check you for that. Um, and we weren't I think that's kind of what I remember a little bit, right? Yeah, so we weren't getting a whole lot. People talking to me and asking me questions. Yep, we weren't getting a whole lot. And at that time, they were telling me, you're not, you know, you're not getting your left side back. And it's really interesting because that was the story then, but only a few, you know, a few, maybe a week later, the surgeons are like, yeah, I think all this is probably coming back. So it was interesting to kind of get all these not mixed messages, but nobody really wanted to commit fully. And there's that left hand thumbs up. Yeah. Nobody wanted to commit fully to what could happen. And I don't think that anybody really knew. Right. Sure. So well, then, for those of you that are interested, I've, I've, met, I've referenced that I had a hemorrhage on my right side. It goes opposite ways to what side is going to be affected. And I remember pretty vividly being checked for whether or not I could feel things on my left side at all. And the person that was doing this was actually holding like a pillow in front of me so that I couldn't cheat, so that I couldn't see what they were touching, and that I had sensation across the left side of my body, which was seen as a very good thing. All this time, informationally, I don't really know what they're looking for. And here's an interesting aspect. I didn't know I had brain surgery, right? They had drilled into my skull and I didn't know it. As a matter of fact, if you remember part one, I mentioned that I ran through some furniture. I'd done some things in my bedroom after losing my balance from the actual stroke. And I thought that that was all injuries, everything I could feel on my head from that particular process. And nobody had told me for a number of days. Speaking of that brain surgery, though, what were they trying to achieve, honey? And you mentioned in part one that you were worried about calling the paramedics. How did you decide to let people drill into my skull? <laughs> uh, well, they were trying to clear out as much of the, the, the blood and the clot and stuff that was there as they could, right? Because the brain doesn't like blood. And the, the blood was in the brain, which is what qualifies it as a deep brain bleed, meaning it's in the brain. But it was near the surface. So what was interesting to me, and I may be misremembering how this all went down, but when I was at the hospital in the ER, the surgeon came in, at one, of, one of the members of the surgery team came in and said, you know, we think we're, we don't think we're going to have to do anything. But, you know, we're going to we're going to take a look. But we don't think we're going to have to do anything. OK, great. But I got a call from her a couple hours later, basically saying you were an ideal candidate. And to all the medical professionals watching the phrase ideal candidate was used three or four times in that conversation. And those were the comforting words I needed to hear that said that that meant to me it's OK to say yes to doing this <laughs> because I, my husband's skull. Go nuts. Yeah. I am always hesitant to open up the human body if we don't have to. So the fact that she said you're an ideal candidate and actually the the where they needed to do the surgery was near the surface. So it's not like they were really going to go digging around in there. Um, so that was that was very helpful. And my one question for her was, is this our best chance of getting back that left side? And she said yes, because Rick, I was only thinking about one thing for you. You need two hands to hold a game controller. <laughs> and Good. if if we can get that left hand back so you can hold that game controller, I was going to do everything I could to make that happen. 
Well, that is very so, nice of you to be thinking about me. And obviously you made the right call, but I do, I do think it's just hard. Everything you described to me in those days after that brain surgery, where you're, you're faced with the question of, should you do this or should you not? It just seems so difficult to make those kinds of choices while I'm asleep on the desk or wherever I am. I, that one to me, I just tried to do whatever it is you would have done. <laughs> and that was, you know, what would Rick, what would Rick Hogue do? Rick Hogue would say, if this surgery can help, we should do it. And so I just tried to think about, I've known you a long time. I've been married to you for a long time. Like what would Rick tell me to do if he were here? And, and that one to me actually seemed like a very easy decision. I, I was standing outside your parents' house when I took that call, I went back inside and I said to them, is there any reason we wouldn't do this? Because I just told them to do this. And sorry, parents, I didn't even really consult you. Um, <laughs> I just, I, I was in full, like proactive, make the decisions, get it done, save Rick Hogue, anything we have to do, we're going to do it kind of mode. And, um, your parents looked at me, they're like, no, why wouldn't we do that? So everybody was on the same page with that. And I'm, I'm glad we did. And it went so smoothly and happened. So, uh, they told us it was going to take three hours. It took 30 minutes and everything went exactly as planned. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it felt like a textbook from my position anyway, a textbook situation. And it was the right choice. It is a, it is a hard choice for anyone to make, but um, it was definitely the right choice. Well, I'm glad you did. And you've mentioned the ventilator a couple of times. What's that about? Why am I on a ventilator during this? So they, they I was at the hospital uh, and talk to the ER doc and I talked to a member of the surgery team and I got to see you. And then we decided we were going to go, go, I was there with a friend. And so I would recommend anyone, if you're in an emergency by this, like this, by the way, that you, uh, get someone, have someone with you who is not a family member. Like your mom is fantastic in emergencies, but in this particular situation, because you're her son, I don't, I don't know. It would have been good for either one of us to be together at the hospital, <laughs> but to have my very best mom friend there, she was fantastic because the doctors would come in, they would say a bunch of things. Then they would say, do you have any questions? And I would look at her and say, do I have any questions? Because I'm just trying to process everything that's happening. And so she would ask all these things, things I wasn't thinking of, things that we had talked about that I forgot about. And she was just invaluable in that support. So we had left to come home and, and get some things. I don't know what I was supposed to get Rick, but we left to come home and get some things and to check on the kids and to check in with your parents and let them know what was going on. And on the drive back to the hospital, I got a call and they said they needed to intubate you. And I really wanted to talk to you again. And I asked them, I was like, can this, can this wait 15 minutes? She's like, no, we need to do it right now. And you were just having trouble, I think, because you were falling asleep, because your body was weak, because of the swelling in the brain, you were having trouble keeping your airway open. They would have had to intubate you for that surgery anyway. Okay. So I, I went ahead and said, okay, of course, right? Because I were interested in, in keeping you alive. So yes, of course, if that's what they're telling me, they absolutely have to do, we're going to do it. So that's what they did. So the next time I saw you, I couldn't have a conversation with you. And that was difficult because it was, it was, a, you were on the ventilator a lot longer than I thought you were going to be. It's a few days, right? Yeah, it was several days. And I had kind of hoped Sunday that we would be able to chat or Monday we would be able to chat or Tuesday we would be able to chat, but it wasn't really until Wednesday when you were strong enough and they were comfortable enough. You had been over breathing the machine all day on Tuesday. So they felt like you were strong enough to, to take off that. That Over breathing, matter. meaning that my breath was strong enough that I didn't. Yeah, you it. were doing most of the work, okay. right? So the machine was not doing most of the work. Sorry, I know you're not a doctor any more than I am. I just, <laughs> I don't know this period of time that well. What I, what I think I was told. Okay. We're doing our best. This is the real life version of what we remember from the medical professionals that talked to us over a very stressful time period. Um, and in answer to the other community question, did I experience something heaven-like or meet any past loved ones? You are not the first person to ask me this. The answer is no. I had weird fantasy dreams that were happening during this time. Like I said, lava mountain, but I did not meet any loved ones or look at anything that looked like heaven from my recollection of these situations. So 
maybe I wasn't that close to death, no matter what my percentages said. As for the rest, let's talk about a few more questions. When you were out of commission, Mrs. Hogue told us that you hit all the goals and about targets, but I have no experience to draw from on what such targets or goals look like. What can be done after surgery? What did you struggle with most? And how did those targets change over time? So I think this is in reference to your community posts where you had a tendency to say all targets achieved and things like that. Yeah. And I think that's a great way to do things. If I'm remembering correctly, you were a little bit concerned about sharing too much of my medical information because you couldn't check with me about what I would want to share or not. Is that right? Yeah, for sure. You know, you're a pretty private person and I didn't want to, I didn't want to overshare. And I, when this was all said and done, I wanted you to say that I did everything perfectly and that you were proud <laughs> of how I, I handled did. it. And I didn't want to let you down. And so that was a, that was a choice I made was to be a little more private about that information. I think you did great. Everything I can see from that period of time looks fantastic to me. And I'm very proud of how you handled it. And I'm alive because of you. So thank you. Um, in terms of this, I would say that this is in reference to a couple of things that they're doing right after the surgery. As I said, they're checking my left side. They're worried about both left neglect, which is, as I understand it, that you can kind of almost completely mentally forget your left side and that you have a left arm or potentially walk into door jams and walls with that left side. And so they're checking to see if I have sensation. And then ultimately they're going to be checking to see if I have movement. So one of the things that I was doing a lot of was essentially pretending to drive a car with my left foot as nurses pushed on the opposite direction to see how much strength I had there, then trying to grip people's hands with my left hand, that kind of thing. I pointed out I can do a thumbs up now. I couldn't do this when I was right out of the surgery and I couldn't do anything with my fingers. Essentially, as that came back slowly, I could move one or two fingers and then I could spread all the fingers. And there were a number of days where I could just do new tricks with my left hand, as I like to describe them on any given morning. They were also checking my swallowing so this was something I didn't know or didn't think of ever before any of this, but they're really worried that after a stroke, you're not going to be able to swallow properly. So I'm not having a lot of food during this time. I'm actually losing a lot of weight immediately after the surgery and for a couple of weeks thereafter. And they're checking to see if I can swallow and ultimately going through a swallow test where they make you eat absolutely terrible graham crackers with stuff on them. And then they check to see them through a machine to see if you're swallowing properly and that you can be trusted with food so that you don't choke yourself. They also are checking things like cognition. I would have people come in and ask me series of questions based around math problems or giving me a set of words to remember for the whole course of the test, then tell them back at the end. Fortunately, I was able to pass those things. And then they're also monitoring my blood pressure, which is what brought me to the hospital and my heart rhythm. So I'm wired up to a lot of stuff. I have an IV. They're checking different panels of drugs at that time. And then they're also checking my left side, my cognition and my blood pressure and heart. So that's basically what I remember from that period. Do you have anything else, honey? I write a funny story right after they took you off the ventilator and they're asking you to, you know, give a thumbs up or move your hand or squeeze. You were, you said, why? <laughs> well, it was like a hundred questions, right? Like in my head, I'm remembering this as them just keep repeating doing it because that's all the memories I have. And I'm just, I'm just laughing because of course Rick Hogue needs to know why we're doing all this stuff. Uh, so, so I, I had a pretty good laugh about that. Yeah. And like then, I said, it's like to me in my head, it's like every 10 seconds, somebody comes in and asks me to give them a thumbs up and I'm just yeah. like, come on people. The very first thing I told you was that it's all going to be okay. And, right. And so I mentioned this in part one, that one of my first memories of being in the hospital like a literal memory with a visual and like I know where I was, was seeing you with like the sun behind you and honestly thinking that you were way too pretty for me. But that's that's one of my first memories that I actually had. And you telling me it was going to be OK it was very comforting at the time. Well, I really believed that. It wasn't there was some stuff I told you just to make you happy, but that I really believed. <laughs> <laughs> that's marriage folks <laughs> and then i told you that the kids were okay and then the next thing you asked me was how, did i pay the bills <laughs> <laughs> that does sound right <laughs> well that's immediately what i would be worried about because we crossed over a month in so you know running the firm i would have had to pay the bills and, yeah. and do did time I pay the and, bills, like and did i call uh did i call your mentor to help with the law firm stuff and i was so happy that i could say yes and everyone that I called over those, I mean, you're, you're here, you're, you're in the hospital doing surgery. I'm on the phone. I'm calling 
all of the people that help keep your business running, all of the you know people that you work with. And um, I knew you had a deal to close. And that was like my number three thought. My thought was, we have to fix Rick Hogue. We've got to keep the kids safe. And th there's a deal that needs to close and somebody needs to close it because we are not going to let the clients down right now. And so, and, and gratefully, I mean, all your clients were fantastic, but also they, so, they was, sure were. so was everyone else who stepped in to help, right? And who picked up the slack and who took care of things. And I felt so much great support. Uh, I'm probably jumping ahead on your list, um, but I felt so much great support from your business community and and the people in you know associated and affiliated with your law firm. That it was that part of things I was very. I had to work through, but it was, they made it easy. Well, clearly I didn't size this slide correctly, but we've got a couple of questions about the help that was offered to us in this period of time. And then also for the rest of our rehab process. The very first one is from nurse Liz, who you might be familiar with on YouTube. It says, what was helpful and unhelpful from your medical team from anything like the way they communicated small things that they did that made you feel less nervous or feel encouraged or things that made you feel uncomfortable. I've got a lot to say about this because I was in hospitals for a very long time. But the very first thing that happened after talking with my wife was that a whole kind of army of nurses and therapists came in to talk to me about what was going to happen and what was going on. And I will say this, they were all fantastic. Everybody was super calm and very much felt like they were on my team and we were going to go and do whatever we needed to do together. And I absolutely felt comfortable and that they were going to take care of me throughout that entire process. That was wonderful. That communication was so important. Now, I will say, in terms of lacking communication, what I could have used more of in that period of time was a little bit of what I call it like a debriefing. Like, again, I'm telling you this story now from a couple of months after the fact and having talked to my wife about it extensively, but I didn't know I had brain surgery. I didn't know exactly what had happened at all. I knew that I had a brain bleed because that was one of the things that people would tell me so that I could answer it back. Do you know why you're here? It's brain bleed. Uh, but I didn't know exactly what had occurred, what they were checking, what anybody was worried about, why I was being tickled on my left side every day, that kind of thing. And so I would love to get more of a kind of informational debrief right at the top end when somebody is fully awoken in the hospital system. I will also say this. I think there's some crosstalk and that isn't great. I had nurses talking poorly about doctors and doctors talking poorly about nurses, all of which I had to trust completely. They were talking about other people that were taking care of me. Sometimes nurses in charge of providing medication would openly question why the doctor was doing X. All that makes you feel a bit unsafe in the moment. And you, the patient, don't have the expertise to know one way or the other what's right or what's wrong. In addition, I think it's useful to get more information out to more of the specialists. When I went to get an ultrasound, for instance, because I was potentially having trouble with my kidneys, they were worried about that while I was in the hospital, I couldn't move my left hand off of where the ultrasound technician wanted to look at my body. And essentially they joked, they said, you know what, what I said, can you move your left hand? I said, no, not really. They said, what, do you have a stroke? That kind of thing. And it's like, yes, actually. And that made me feel a little uncomfortable in the moment. These are the kinds of things that I remember. Nobody's perfect. No large organization is ever gonna function perfectly at all times. None of these things detracted from my overall experience. I still think these were some of the best people I've ever met. And I have such a great deal of thanks for what nurses do and for what my therapists have been doing now for months, because I couldn't do those jobs. That's just not in me. And they are just angels from above, in my opinion. And I could not be more thankful for them. Family, what were the wait, things your wife- Wait, hold on. Can I jump yeah. in? Yeah. Because my, in. my experience was a little bit different. Of course, I'm not the one that's, that's being worked on. So <laughs> I'm probably feeling differently than you were. But I was really impressed with how well everything had been documented because mm. I could ask the nurse, Hey, you know, did the doctors like I got there as soon as I could in the morning, but sometimes I would still miss rounds because they would round before visiting hours began. And so, um, wait, can I side note and tell a story real quick? Yes, of course. You're on okay. the stream. Go nuts. So I want to, I want to just side note that, uh, and some of you have maybe heard this story, but listen, look, I'm going to call this, be careful what you complain about because it might secretly be your biggest blessing. Last year, our school decided they were going to change the start time of school. They were going to move it up a half hour. And I have to drive my kids to school. And I complained the whole time, Rick, you will tell them, I am a big whiner. 
and I complain. Sometimes you have very passionate feelings on the circumstances of your life. That is, that is a nice way to say I was a big whiner. I complained for months about the start time leading up to school. I complained for months after school started. But you know what? <laughs> when the kids finally went back to school, I was able to take them to school, which is very important to me that I drive them and spend that time in the car with them and immediately leave there and go to the hospital. And I was able to get there as soon as visiting hours started. And if it had been the old time, I would have been there maybe an hour later or even 90 minutes after visiting hours. And I would have missed a lot of information. I would have missed valuable time with you. And so it turns out that this thing I've complained about is really a, a big blessing. So complain less is the moral of the story, I think. But I would come anyway, let's get back to this. I would come and chat. And even if I missed uh, the doctor's rounding, the nurses would have information they could tell me or they could look up the information. And at one point I caught the team in the hallway and uh, on my way to your room, they had already seen you. And we had just like a quick chat about uh, you, where you were going to go to rehab and what some of the options were. And yeah. later that day, okay, so keep in mind, I'm in the hall with them. They're not having their meeting in your room. We're having this conversation. Later that day, there's a person assigned to deal with our, our case and to help transition to the next stage of this process. And she comes in and says, okay, well, I heard you had this conversation this morning and this is what you want to do. And I'm working on that for you. And from the conversation I had in the hall, all that information got relayed to the correct person. So I was amazed at how well everything had been documented, how well everyone had communicated with one another. I think it was great. Yeah, that was directly on our team because they were making sure that everybody knew what was going on. And I will tell you the, ex the excitement from medical professionals, anytime you could do something new, is what kept me going, right? Because I'm in it. I'm we're in the forest. We're in the wilderness. We're we're living through this thing. And here comes the nurse to say, "Look at these beautiful flowers that are right here," right? And it's you being able to move your foot up and down. And to us, it's like, "Uh, this isn't really a big deal. We're still in this wilderness." And I loved that they were able to put that in perspective for us that this is a big deal. This is a big thing. This is a good thing. We should get excited about this. And that was, I felt like that was really helpful. They were an exceptional team. Very and, professional, very positive. Absolutely. Yes. And, and they were, they were incredible. So. No, I think my complaints are not really even complaints. They're just, yeah. I think yeah. like somebody writing a script or a book or something else, I think you can just forget what the reader doesn't know. So to me, I think a little bit of this is just, they have all this information and they kind of know what's going on and they kind of forget that the guy in the bed maybe doesn't know all of those things. Because I think it, at one known. point I, yeah, at one point I asked you, I said, do you, do you know what's happening? And you said, no, I said, okay, let me explain. <laughs> yeah. And I and felt I think, a little bit like they were talking over you. They would come in and talk to me, but I felt a little bit like they were talking over you. Right. Well, and I, I understand it's, it's, you know, it's a brain damage kind of situation. Right. You don't know what my place is, but right. yeah, I mean, if, if the question is what could be a little better, I would have loved a little bit more information. And maybe they think the family's handling that. Maybe the family thinks the medical staff is doing that. But yeah. speaking of family, we mentioned in part one, it's so important for them to just be there. It's so nice to know that your wife is there or your kids have come to visit you or your parents are there right in the hospital room with you, that that is so, so helpful. But you've already heard all of the things that Mrs. Hoaglaw has done, which is that she handled the finances of the firm. She talked to clients. She handled so many things. Uh, and what it really did was take it off my plate, right? It's it's not necessarily that any given thing was the most important thing in the moment, but it's so useful when you're trying to recover from something like this or just trying to work through an acute event like this to have somebody that is there and taking all these things off your plate and you just don't have to worry about them because she's so, so helpful. And I'm reminded of one of my favorite movies that you might've heard me talk about in this space before, called Defending Your Life, in which the recently deceased characters, this takes place in kind of quasi heaven, played by Meryl Streep and Albert Brooks, are discussing missing their loved ones, their kids and their spouses. When Meryl Streep says she misses them but feels okay about it, she also says as part of this sequence 
but she was told that they, whoever's in charge at defending your life, make it that way so that the dead can get on with the business of examining their lives, the purpose of the movie. I really feel like Mrs. Hogue did that for me, taking every worry off my plate so I could focus on the healing. And I'm so, so appreciative of that. So thank you, honey. I'm glad that was my goal. Yeah, there's Meryl Streep. There's Albert Brooks. Albert Brooks, you might know as the father of Nemo from Finding Nemo if you're of a certain age. But Defending Your Life, couldn't recommend it more. You will find it a bit of a lawyer movie. Sorry about that. But it is excellent. It's a comedy. Do check it out if you're at all interested. What else you got there, Rick? What else do I have there? So like I said, I, I kind of knocked this one off the bottom of the slide. So I apologize for that. But what did the community do that helped or what was too much from the community? And one thing I would say here is that the community, all of you that are watching, have been just amazing. Very early on in the process, my wife arranged to have my dad pick up my office mail. And both of my parents were just floored by the outpouring of notes, letters and packages that you all sent. Personally, it was very gratifying for me to have a tangible representation that my time spent doing silly things on YouTube was having a positive effect. And the actual messages and gifts themselves were like a warm hug. I liken it to Tom Sawyer's funeral. It's rare, too rare in my opinion, that we get to see the impact that we are having. And I think each and every one of you who sent mail, supported the GoFundMe that my sister and wife set up, or just came to the channel to visit, I really, really appreciate every single thing that you guys did. At no point was it too much. At no point was it overbearing. And I can't say the same for every interaction I otherwise had during this period of time. As for the last page of questions, you might remember these from part one, but I think it's important to kind of go over these in every part here. How did you feel during the stage? Let's talk about mental health a little bit. I would say that this was a very trying time mentally. You're trying to come to grips with what had happened. It's very easy to resent your circumstances and otherwise spiral into a bit of grief. Fortunately, and I know some of you have heard this story either on the channel or on Twitter. Every time I went into the kind of, I wish this hadn't happened place and started to resent everything and feeling bad about myself, my good friend Gandalf would show up. And if you recall this from the Fellowship of the Ring, Gandalf says to Frodo, who says, hey, I wish this didn't happen to me. So do all who live to see such times, but that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. And then a lot of people have asked me, you know, where is my positivity come from? How have I done so well in rehab? Part of that is that I have this internal blocker for feeling bad about myself on any of this stuff. And it's Gandalf who just sits there and says, look, that's over, that's done. Don't, don't have pity on this stuff. That, that doesn't do you any good. Just decide what you're going to do. And we decide every day to go to rehab and to try to knock it out of the park. And that's been working so far. And that doesn't guarantee results, but I think it is necessary if not sufficient. This was also a time of heightened emotionality for me. It's almost entirely impossible to properly thank somebody for what you believe is saving your life, right? So I remember, and this may have been a dream, I, I have to point out, trying to thank my night nurse, Jeff, who was awesome, for working so hard for me to keep me safe that because of him and others like him my girls were going to have a dad and that i could never thank him enough for that and i remember just kind of being really really emotional about that sequence of events that honestly sitting here right now i'm not actually sure happened but that i definitely lived as an experience as my friend would have told me when she was going through and trying to convince me that none of this had actually occurred so i never met jeff and at one point i asked your mom is, is Jeff existed? even real? <laughs> yeah. Okay. And she said, That's yes. We were people. Is Jeff I've met, real? I've met him. He is real. I was like, okay, all right. This is <laughs> this is real. I I just want to add, you know, one of the one of the phrases that I kind of hang on to is don't look backwards. You aren't going that way. Mm. And so there wasn't ever at any point, do I wish this didn't happen? Absolutely. But there was never any point where I was like, man, I really regret. Like I I don't I don't like to live with regret. That's, you know, right up there with fear. That's going to hold you back in life. And so all I was thinking about in that moment was we're, we're, we're moving forward and we're going to do whatever we have to do right now. And we're going to get it done because that's what we do. Hoags don't quit. This is what we're going to do. But you quote again off to me almost daily. And that was that whole time was very emotional for both of us. It was a really it was a really intense, we had a lot of amazing conversations. I wish this were not the circumstance that we had them in, but we yeah. had a lot of amazing conversations just about life and and our philosophies about life and 
you know, what we meant to each other and what we cared about and, um, and a lot of other things I can't even remember right now. And, and it was, it was, uh, it was beautiful. And also, you know, the circumstances really sucked. So, but yeah, a very emotional time, a lot of emotions. Yeah. And I do think that you were focused on this next aspect, which is that I think psychological help is very useful during all of this. Among my other therapy meetings that we'll talk about, I've regularly met with a neuropsychologist to discuss things. I think I'm more positive than many, but it's certainly a lot to grapple with in any of these issues. And I know that was a focus that you had for, in particular, my rehabilitation that would come up in part three. Yeah, that was really, really important to me. You know, we, we've both watched a lot of people in our life struggle with and process and deal with mental health issues. And one of the only things I read about stroke recovery is that there is, there can be depression and a lot of things that come with it, right? It's a, this is a, we're in an alternate timeline. This is, this is a forever life change. It is different forever. Even if you have a hundred percent recovery, right? Because we went through this. So our life is forever changed alternate timeline. Um, and mental health and managing your mental health through that is a huge, huge part of that. And so, I mean, it's hard to keep a positive mental attitude, but I will tell you very early, the first couple of days you were off that vent, we, something, some, we were chatting about something and you said to me, look, we have a choice we can be depressed and be sad, or we can choose to use humor and try to get through this as positively as possible. And that's what I'm choosing to do. Oh yes, I was very sarcastic and goofing around with the therapists and nurses quite a lot in all stages of this process, definitely. Yes, you said, I want to win Funniest, pa funniest Patient March, 2023. I did. And, and I said, Rick, it's, it's January. And you said, I that's know, that's funny. why it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. So uh, you Here's said- Here's the thing about phone. telling jokes, by the way, when you're in like the neuro rehabilitation <laughs> unit or the ICU is that everybody thinks there's something wrong with your brain. Yeah. So you get amusing looks from everybody. Rick, it's not March. <laughs> yes, I know. That's the joke. <laughs> but that's, I mean, you set, you set the tone for all of us. Right. And you and and as usual in life, you even set the tone for me that this is how we're going to approach this and do this. And and we're going to we're going to use humor and a positive attitude to get through this. That's very nice of you to say. I didn't see another way to go, honestly. And speaking of other ways to go. So at this point in time, I've had brain surgery where my wife just described it. They essentially stuck a tube into my brain and sucked blood out and put it in a bag. I had my skull opened up and closed. I am still confined to my bed at this point. And if I'm moving around, it's in a wheelchair that somebody puts me in and takes me down to ultrasound or takes me down to a swallow test, those kinds of things. Not even. No, they wouldn't even get you in a wheelchair because you had I already been in bed. Down. You had been in bed too much. You, your, like, your core strength was weak. And so they would take you down in the, in a, like, in your bed, essentially. They would wheel your whole bed downstairs yeah nurses are really strong yo oh they nurses would, are so you across strong. like four different beds and then send you out into the ha hallway yeah but i did pull up a couple of your community posts here because this is where we really needed help we needed to get into a good rehab facility and this is you at about that time saying all goals today were achieved i'm breathing on my own got a few words out of him including your story about me asking why which i don't remember but it sounds like me <laughs> I have more things to say, but my thoughts are jumbled. jumble. Thank you. And you continue to be the hug we need. If you're a praying sort of person, I'm asking for something very specific. I want you to pray that the right bed at the right rehab center will be available at the time we need it. And this, at this point in time, you already knew where you wanted to send me, right? Well, I wasn't, I wasn't really sure. Some people in your community had said to me, you need to make sure you're ending up at the right place. There are a lot of great places around here. I got some good advice from some people locally as well. But at the end of the day, based on everything I'd read and researched, I really felt like this was the right place. And if we could get in here, it's very difficult to get in there. There aren't that many beds. 
there. And then it would be, you know, if we could get in there, then that would probably be the best place for you. I mean, I'm kind of just flying in the dark trying to make these decisions. And I mentioned this briefly to the team and, and they, you know, there was a space available for you. And after being at Chelsea hospital for, I don't know, an hour, it was very clear. It was exactly where we needed to be. It was the perfect place to be. And it's as it turns out, country hospital you could imagine. Yeah, it was, it was lovely. And when we get to talking about that, I will talk about why, <laughs> but it was, it was absolutely where, where we should have been. And I'm so glad that we were able to do that. And thank you to our community for praying on that and thinking on that and sharing that with your church community. And um, honestly, uh, Rick, I posted anything at all about this because I know you maybe wouldn't even want to share this, these things with anyone, because all I could think was, how do I get the most number of prayers happening the fastest right now? And, and that's, you know, and, and obviously after a week or two of you not being on YouTube, people were going to wonder where you were. So I felt like that needed to be shared. So th those were, that, that was kind of the impetus for my actions. And yes, I, I really, um, I, I wanted us to be at Chelsea hospital. And Chelsea is hospital is the other hospital that we're going to be doing a fundraiser for. They were absolutely fantastic. The therapist Amazing. that we're going to talk to as part of this series are affiliated with Chelsea Hospital. Wonderful hospital. I will say this because I will say it in part three as well. Living in a hospital is not my favorite experience ever in my life. There are a lot of people that have a lot of thoughts about what you should and should not do while you're at the hospital. And that's not exactly how I like to roll. But as far as hospitals go, Chelsea Hospital was absolutely fantastic. And as you can see on their website, they had a specialty in inpatient rehabilitation services for patients recovering from stroke, brain injury, amputation, major trauma, neurological disorders, or other complicated medical conditions. And I feel like I got the best care. And that's all because of you all in the community my, and my awesome wife. So thank you so much, honey. Well, you're very welcome. You're worth it. <laughs> I, I like to think so. I like to think so, but you never know. I think you are. Um, you don't really like to test these things. So it's good no. To <laughs> Uh, listen, I, there is something else I want to add here, sure. which you kind of touched on it, which is like, how do you thank someone for saving your life? You and I, I, you can't, I called my dad uh, partway through this stay here at Ascension and said, how do I, how do I thank these people? And he's been through some medical things with a family member. And uh, so I, I didn't know who else would have a good perspective on this, but he said to me, you go in every day, thankful, happy generous, respectful. And I, I always think about um, Emily D. Baker's TED talk at the end. She says, I was going to be the shiniest, brightest, you know, version of myself essentially. And so that's what I tried to be was the shiniest, brightest hogue that had a smile for everybody and a thank you and a kind word and a helpful attitude because not only did I want them to know that you were going to get incredible support because if, if they know you're going to get incredible support, they're going to give you incredible support. Right? So not only did I want them to know that you were going to get incredible support, but I wanted them to know how thankful we were. So that was, that was and how she's I was telling herself folks, these hospitals, they like know her. I think they're, her name is on a plaque somewhere at this <laughs> point. She was there so much and so invested in every aspect of all of this. It was important to me to to express our hogness <laughs> to the world, right? And to let and to let them know, you know, how much we appreciated them. Well, she made there, me look good. But yeah, I mean, I was trying to be as respectful as possible, the the nurses and like that is a job that just seems so hard. And you could hear in different rooms and in the hallways patients not being quite as nice to the nurses. And or I just family members, family members that were upset and yelling at the sure. nurses. Well, it's, a, it's a stressful time. I get it's, it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, listen, I know you have more to say. Are you almost done? No, this is this is just about done with part two. So if you have anything to add, absolutely. I, was I gonna, do I was think there's one thing that you have not discussed that is important we talk about. Okay, let's talk about it. The game. The game? Oh, the game. well, on about January 5th or 6th, while 
I'm talking to my wife about what has happened, why does my head hurt, that kind of thing. I do mention, hey, I think there was a football game that happened last week that I was looking forward to a lot. For those of you that don't know, I'm a big Michigan Wolverine fan. Michigan was in the semifinals of the national championship. That was a game to take place on New Year's Eve. If you're looking at the timeline here, I'm out of commission for that game. And I say, how did it go? Because we were big time favorites. We were favored by like three touchdowns or so. And my wife says something like, you don't want to know. And I'm like, you're no, kidding. I, I looked at you and just was, all I could think was really, I have to be the one to, oh man. <laughs> and, and I just shook my head. I said, I'm sorry, honey. I thought you were lying. Yes, I you, you called me a liar. Things. I thought those. I, I thought you were doing one of those things, you know, where you're like, "Oh, it, it went horribly," and like, "I'm just joking." You, you thought for the next three days, you thought I was lying to you. Um, yeah. So that was kind of funny because you you didn't think I was telling you the truth at all. This was not the most clear portion of my lifespan in terms of <laughs> brain thinking. I thought that Michigan was just going to show up at the national championship and everybody would be cool with it. <laughs> Yeah, you kept saying that too. That was really funny. Oh, man. So, yes. In point of fact, I was a little bit delirious during points of this. So thank you for the question asking if other people had different thoughts about what was happening while I was going through all this. The answer is undoubtedly yes. Not only during the surgery itself where I was having all sorts of like anesthesia dreams, but even after that, because I couldn't separate dreaming from waking, and I still can't. Those are all real experiences as I remember them. I am I am very thankful that there were a lot of people around me to just kind of lightly talk to me and, and be like, sure, Rick, sure, absolutely. Until somebody finally said, no, this is ridiculous. We gotta we gotta walk through this, Rick. Does this make any sense to you at all? No, I guess not. But that's that's a hard thing to grapple with. So I'm very appreciative of everybody that worked it through with me during that entire period of time, especially you, Mrs. Hogloss. So thank you very much. And thank you all the rest of you for being here for part two. I hope this was informative and interesting. Certainly it's it's interesting for me to reflect on this entire journey that we've been on now for months here. And I really am glad to be able to have a platform like this to make videos like this to hopefully tell folks what that situation is like, both the medical professionals and the family members that have to deal with it. I have said to both my wife, my brother, and others in my family, I don't know if I could sit in that chair. That seems to be the harder job to me. I know my left side doesn't work properly and, and rehab is really tough. I'm going to go into that in more detail in part three. But sitting in the opposite chair, not quite knowing what's wrong with the other person, your loved one, and not being able to just fix it with a snap of your fingers seems like a much harder road. And I'm so thankful that you were willing to do it, Mrs. Oglaw, and that everybody has been willing to do it with me because it's so, so helpful. But I think it's so, so hard. Can I say one thing about that? Sure. I don't think anyone thinks that they can do it until they have to. And well, I'm glad your metal passed the test. I just don't want to test mine. I will speak very frankly right now. And I, I want everyone to know that reasonable minds can differ. And if this is not your jam, that's totally okay. But I will tell you that I believe it was absolutely supernatural and that my, my faith and that God were that's, that's what it was. That's where the strength came from because there's no way that humanly I could have done it. So, right. And you didn't falter at all. I mean, you were amazing for the entire period of time. That is I, my, look, well, okay. Lord of Rings has a lot to say about grace too. So, I mean, yeah, to be, absolutely. To be fair, there was a very, <laughs> a very generous friend I will forever be grateful to who took my phone call where I, used every curse word there was for about 30 minutes. So I maybe wasn't like the- You the, didn't present it to me. I wasn't the, the you know, pivotal example of grace under pressure necessarily. There were plenty of moments where I cried in the car or I cursed on the phone a lot and they know who they are and thank you very much. I will never forget that. And, you know, but, but the, the rest of it, and especially the Rick Hogue facing part of it is I was not going to bring that in there. I was going to bring into that room positivity, encouragement, and just pure love because that I believed was what was going to help heal you. And, and, and my faith and God, that's, that's what it was. And I, I really believe that. Well, thank you. And thank you for everybody that prayed in the community and for, 
talking us through all of this, including helping my wife during a period where I felt very guilty, honestly, people talking about emotionality for quote unquote, not being there for her during this. I had a long conversation with her, which I think we'll probably talk about either in part three or part four, where I basically said I felt enormously guilty about being unconscious during this traumatic time where you had to deal with your unconscious husband. I did though. I mean, that's the honest to God truth. So thank you so much for everybody for joining us here for part two. And thank you for joining us as part of this series. Part three will be in a couple of days with a little luck. So thank you very much. And again, hopefully you don't need any of this information ever, but I'm very glad for you to join us. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.